There we go. Um, so welcome everyone to this seminar, which is um, a UNSW stat seminar series, but also um, hosted through SAC, so statistic across campuses. Um, so today we are very pleased to have Joshua Bond from QUT. Uh, Joshua is about to finish his uh, PhD at QUT and uh, currently starting a postdoc position with Chris Dorvendi. Uh, Josh's interests are in uh, Bayesian computations, Bayesian methods, uh, multi-level and hierarchical models and regularization, constrained non-linear regression. Uh, today, Josh is going to talk about um, improving particle filters by learning modified paths. So thanks, Josh, for accepting to give his talk, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Boris, and everyone for having me. It's a great pleasure to be giving um, an, a seminar for the first time in a while. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about particle filters today and uh, why they can get a bit twisted or why you might want them to be a bit twisted. Um, but first off, I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm giving this talk from uh, Turrbal and Yagara land uh, where QUT sits and just want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and also acknowledge that UNSW is on uh, Gadigal land um, and pay my respects to those elders. Um, so this is joint work with Anthony Lee from Bristol University and Chris Trivandi and I've done all of this work within the School of Mathematics um, during my PhD and now a little bit during my postdoc and affiliated with the QT Center for Data Science. So my main research area is um, adaptive methods for SMC tuned with, with particles. So you run an SMC algorithm and you either tune it as you go or, or run it once and use the particles generated to create an even better version of that SMC algorithm uh, in the next go. Uh, and this work uh, focuses on particle filters for dynamic models um, that have difficult or intractable mutation kernels um, or transition densities, if you want to call them that. Call them that. Um, so the main motivation or one of the main motivations in this area is things like hidden Markov models. There's some latent states uh, X uh, that have a Markov, um, that, that, are, that are governed by a Markov process or a Markov chain. Um, and then you have some observations that are related to each of those latent states, which kind of inform what the likely um, values of those unknown latent states were. And this crops up in time series and robotics, for example. Um, but also uh, particle filters get used for hidden Markov models and similar type models for model selection um, and in pseudo-marginal pseudo methods for like Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and the main problem or difficulty with these models is they involve a high dimensional normalizing constant that you want to estimate, uh, which can look something like this, where you're integrating over um, the initial distribution for, for the first variable uh, that gets updated for each um, latent state that you have through the Markov chain. And then there's some kind of weighting G um, potential function. So here the potential is just going to be the likelihood and that's um, dependent on the data that's observed. Um, and particle filters are important in this context because they exploit the conditional structure of these models by kind of decomposing um, the, the, the inference or um, process into um, stages where you just focus on one latent state at a time and that kind of um, creates a series of sub problems which are easier to solve than the, the entire problem all at once. Um, so just a little note on notation uh, and here everything is an integral. Um, so I'm sorry to do this to you on a, on a Friday afternoon, but um, hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, so I'm going to talk about some probability distributions and, and some measures, um, mu, and uh, I'm going to define the measure of some set S um, by the first integral and then the measure of some function var phi um, by this uh, integral. So basically either um, counting or in, in some sense, uh, the probability of each of the um, components of S or we're using the var phi function to uh, weight different elements of that are in the um, measure space. Um, and 
when we write things like uh, the dx without any integrals present, we're implicitly actually defining an integral or defining a, a distributional measure that we haven't um, we haven't evaluated a particular set or or function yet. But that's not too scary because if we're in the nice world of uh, of real of being on the real line, we can change these things to density. So here, p mu is just is just the density that everyone is um, usually a bit more comfortable with. And we're just doing a standard uh, integral over, over a set S, which is a subset of the real line, or um, just taking uh, a, a, a weight uh, over uh, the entire real line, that's that bar phi, uh, which works out just to be an expectation. Um, and then uh, we also have to deal with some Markov kernels or non-negative kernels when it's not a on a not, not a probability distribution. And here it's essentially the same, except now we have this condition on, on, on this V element, which is in the state space somewhere. Um, the only like really funky notation is this semi-group notation where you evaluate the function var phi. Um, can, uh, yeah, so you're taking the integral of, of var phi um, after you've decided what the uh, conditional element v is going to be. Um, and it's written with the var phi first, then the v next, because uh, it allows for uh, this kind of notation where you can say um, k of var phi is an integral that's dependent on the v, and then I want to average over um, all the Vs by using the measure mu. So it allows for that notation a bit ni more nicely. Okay, so that, that was it. That was the, the, the notation stuff. Um, so I'm gonna take you on a little journey from Feynman CAC models to, to particle filters now. Um, so a one step Feynman CAC model looks, can look something like this. You start from an initial distribution E to O, uh, the potential function, which is this G naught, uh, applies some kind of weight to all the elements, oh, sorry, all the, um, all the possible outcomes of, of that initial distribution. That will give you an updated distribution, which is this eta hat naught um, in the gray on this on the second um, stage, and then from there you apply mutation, um, which to the updated distribution, which essentially um, moves uh, moves the probability mass around, but it actually creates like a second uh, a second dimension to your state space, and you integrate out the the first one and don't care about that anymore. So a feynman cac model starts with initial distribution, at least in one step, it gets updated with a potential function and then the predictive distribution is what comes out after you apply a mutation kernel. Uh, and you can talk about both the unnormalized versions of these, which are measures or the normalized versions, which are distributions. Um, so that's just in one step. A, a one step particle filter does exactly the same thing, uh, except instead of having uh, a distribution which is um, passed around, you have realizations or particles from a distribution which are passed around. And so instead of having um, your distribution eta being um, the true distribution, you have a particle approximation, which is what this superscript n is for. Um, but you have particles, they get weights, and that becomes an unnormalized empirical measure. Uh, you can normalize it with self-normalized important sampling, which will give you an estimate of the of the normalizing constant. Um, and then you can pass those particles that have been weighted through a Markov kernel to get the next set of um, predictive particles that you're up, uh, next set of particles which are related to the predictive distribution. So a feynman cac model is just the, the distribution, the distributional notation that sits. Um, underneath what we're doing when we do particle filters or sequential Monte Carlo. Um, with the added thing is often in particle filters, you do some kind of resampling. Um, so an n-step feynman cac model can be defined recursively. So I'm just putting this here for completeness, but basically all we're doing is instead of our initial distribution being um, the eta naught, we take whatever eta, um, P minus one that we're up to, we do the weighting using G P minus one, and then we do the mutation where we pass it through the, the Markov kernel. Um, and then we can normalize that if we work out the normalizing constant. 
And then they're also, once you have this um, recursive definition, you can also define the updated counterpart. So that's just where you actually do the uh, weighting with the potential function at time G, and you can also normalize those. Um, so that's more just for completeness, but essentially we're just doing this multiple times. So we're running through the Femacac model, multiple, sorry, the procedure of generating, um, of, of weighting and then moving or mutating uh, multiple times. And that's the same for like an end step particle filter. Um, yeah, so just to sum up, we have predictive measures which don't have the hats, which happen after we've done a mutation step. We have updated measures that do have the hat, which happen after um, the weighting or potential step. Um, and the eaters are going to be the ones that are normalized, and the um, gammas are the ones that are unnormalized. Um, okay, so why is this important? Well, these models define like a path measure and the sequence of di distributions, but also how we get from one of one of these distributions to another. Um, and there are infinitely many of these models that can perform the same statistical inference. So even if you look at your hidden Markov model and write down exactly what the data generating, data generating process is, you can actually adjust um, your hidden Markov model, or you can actually adjust the model that is associated with your particle filter but still do the same inference you would have done had you have just used what the process that is um, the process that is related to your actual model of data that you want to do. So there's many ways um, to do the inference you're interested in, um, which actually means there's many bad models for SMC uh, if if you're just going to choose one uh, in terms of like the variance of the estimates they give for the um, latent states or the normalizing constants and things like that. So the natural question is like, how do we improve an existing Feynman CAC model? So if we start with the natural um, model related to the hidden Markov model, how do we, how are we going to improve um, the model for some kind of given statistical inference that we're interested in? Maybe that's getting the normalizing constant. Maybe that's looking at um, the terminal latent states. So that's where twisted Feynman CAC models come in. Um, so just a note on, on the name, um, twisting or a change of measure is, is generally when you take a, a distribution of interest. So here we've got mu and you weight all of the potential um, state space values that it could take. So X um, by some uh, positive function. And so here it's psi and then you normalize so that it's still a probability measure. Um, obviously your psi needs to be integrable and it probably needs to be greater than, the measure of the um, psi needs to be finite and greater than zero. Uh, the classic example is exponential tilting or twisting where you just take um, the psi equal to the exponential of negative lambda x. Um, yeah, that's the classic one. And uh, if, it's, if it's a continuous, um, if it's a probability distribution on continuous space, the new density is just going to be proportional to your original density multiplied by this psi function. So that kind of crops up in Bayesian statistics all the time. Um, in terms of what that can do to a one-step twisted feynman uh, model is when, if, if we do some kind of optimal twisting, which I haven't defined yet, you can actually make it so that your potential function is just constant. And when your potential function is constant, when you do the reweighting step, your initial distribution and your updated distribution are going to be exactly the same. Um, and then when you do the Markov step to get to the predictive distribution, um, you've got your initial being, uh, yeah, your initial being the same as your updated, and then your predictive. Uh, changes. Yeah, the predictive is the only thing that changes. Um, but you do the twisting such that the terminal distribution is actually the one that you were targeting. So that hasn't changed compared to the first setup that I, um, the, the first version of this that I had up on the slides. Okay, what does that mean for a particle filter based on this? Well, 
you generate samples from your initial distribution, if you can do that. And then you apply the weighting function, which is just, or the potential function, which is just constant. So you're, you don't need to do any important sampling between the initial distribution and the updated distribution, which means your samples for the updated distribution are perfect. And then when you apply the Markov kernel to those perfect samples, your next set of uh, particles will also be perfectly sampled. So if, if you use an optimal twisting function, um, you don't need to do resampling and you have a perfect sampler. And I'll touch back on that point um, in a second. So I, I just showed um, how it would, an example for, for a one stage um, or one step Feynman-Cac model. But in, in reality, these um, models have multiple iterations of the weight, then move, then weight, then move steps. So if you take any um, measurable set, uh, any measurable size, so set of functions from zero to n, and define your twisted Markov uh, kernels, which relate to your twisted Feynman-Cac model, um, this way, where you're just doing a change of measure on each of them and normalizing appropriately. Uh, so if you do that, and then also twist the potential functions in a particular way, so dividing by the twisting function at each step, but also multiplying by this, this integral of the next twisting function um, conditional on the current state, then um, this, this will define a new Feynman-Cac model. And it will also be that it targets the correct um, terminal distribution for your original Feynman-Cac model. Uh, and so why would you define these twisting functions, um, the, sorry, define these twisted Markov kernels and twisted potential functions in this way? It's because when you write down this path measure, um, which is like the whole Feynman-Cac model, um, then it preserves these quantities. So it preserves the terminal um, updated distribution, which is usually what we're interested with um, SMC and both the normalized version, so the um, distribution and the measure, um, but it also preserves um, the quantity of your normalizing constant, which makes sense. Um, but it does change the intermediate dis intermediate distributions as you go along. Um, but because you know that you're targeting the correct distribution, if you sit down and work out what the optimal twisting functions will be, it turns out that there are these functions which incorporate all future information um, with respect to the latent states. So this is the expectation of every um, future potential function conditional on the current point that we're at XP. Uh, and the expectation is, is respect, with respect to the underlying Markov chain that you um, have that sets up your model. Okay, if you do that, if you choose these, your particle filter estimate of the twisted normalizing constant will equal the true normalizing constant almost surely. Uh, and that's for a finite n. So even if you use one particle, so it's this idea that you're getting exact samples from your, um, um, from your particle filter uh, is, is coming back again. Um, and that's because you don't have to do any weighting. So you're essentially just using a series of Markov kernels, which are perfectly adapted for the, to, to generate um, realizations from the terminal distribution. So this idea has been used in practice in the iterated auxiliary particle filter and in controlled um, sequential Monte Carlo. And they learn these twisting functions using a recursion. Uh, and the recursion looks like this. Um, and if you go back and look at the uh, definition of the twisting functions, uh, sorry, the twisted potential functions, these values of the optimal psi are exactly what is required to give the potential functions to, to be constant. Um, so you can set your terminal twisting function just to be the final potential function. And then you need to integrate that with respect to the um, 
previous Markov kernel uh, and multiply by the next potential function and just work backwards uh, until you generate all of these um, potential functions. Uh, so this motivate, motivates recursive iterative learning, except you usually can't um, calculate the, usually can't um, very easily uh, write down like a functional form for these, for these optimal psi functions. Um, so what you do is you run a particle filter. Say you're at the very start, you run your particle filter on your base feynman keck model and generate um, a set of particles. And then you find um, some kind of approximation, generally using uh, like a linear regression on the log scale of um, these estimated var, sorry, these estimated uh, psi tilde values. So it just works out to be a regression. Um, and you can do this using backward recursion or um, sometimes it's recurred, referred to as uh, dynamic programming. And then you can repeat this a few times until you get stable estimates of what these um, twisting functions should be. Um, so existing applications of this type of recursive learning to learn what these twisted twisting function should be, um, assume that when you twist the Markov kernel, you can do that analytically. Uh, so that really lends itself to using normal models and an exponential quadratic um, twisting function uh, because you can calculate what the twisting what, what the twisted Markov kernels can be uh, exactly. Um, and that's why almost, well, the two main papers in this in this area, just focus on Gaussian mutation kernels and these Gaussian-like uh, twisting functions. Um, so now we're going to move on to, I guess, my my work. Uh, we want to move on, move beyond exact uh, twisting. So uh, this uh, can be motivated by uh, two main examples. The first is where um, the Markov kernel that you have is easy to generate samples from, but hard to write down the density. And the second is like a subclass, or not, not a subclass. The second is um, when you want to use a twisting function that you can't uh, very easily apply or, or twist the, the Markov kernel that you're interested in, um, which is the second case. And so the, the idea here is to bypass the, the analytical um, like hurdle, we're gonna use a rejection sampler to get samples from the twisted Markov kernel and we'll use unbiased estimates of the twisted potentials so the rejection sample just looks like this. If we restrict the whatever um, twisting function we're currently at, at time p, um, to be between zero and one, we can propose from the base Markov kernel and just accept when we uh, get a realization that um, has a high enough value for evaluated at the, at the phi, sorry, at the psi that we're interested in. Um, and any acceptance from that sampler will have the correct twisted distribution. So we can actually sample from it exactly, but it might be um, costly. And as for the getting unbiased estimates of the twisted potentials, well, um, we can define a new twisted G where the, this integral in green that we're interested in is instead of being calculated analytically, we're gonna define it as um, the average of the um, next, the, the in time, the next psi twisting function um, evaluated at draws from that um, next Markov kernel. So that's like doing that, that integral using um, vanilla Monte Carlo. Um, so this type of idea, um, is applicable to any feynman cac model where you can bound um, the twisting functions that you're willing to, to, to work with. Uh, and so you use this rejection sampler, it's exact, but it's potentially costly. 
and you use the Monte Carlo estimate, which is really simple, but it's potentially noisy. So they're the two downsides that we have to watch out for. Um, so how do we address those concerns? Well, uh, we'd really like to be able to control the acceptance rate um, so that we don't have a rejection sampler embedded in our particle filter, which just goes on for way too long or potentially infinitely if, if it's a really bad a really um, informative twisting function. Um, so the acceptance rate uh, conditional on the current particle that we're at uh, is just this in first integral here, which is just the average over the um, twisting function with respect to the base Markov kernel. Uh, and we can write down what the average acceptance rate is. So the acceptance rate we'd expect on average within our twisted um, SMC sampler or particle filter will just be uh, that function. Um, so it's an integral, but, it, but that function uh, averaged over the particles that av averaged over the updated measure at time, the updated twisted measure at time P minus one. Um, so that's a problem because we don't actually have any particles uh, for that twisted uh, for that twisted distribution. So we haven't, we, we want to use the twisting function omegas, but in order to calculate the average acceptance rate, we need a, a measure that it's, that is based on, or a um, distribution that's based on the twisted Feynman CAC model, which we actually want to twist. So um, how do we estimate this value before we even run the twisted particle filter? Um, so a pro little proposition that um, we have is that you can actually rewrite this average acceptance rate using a previously twisted um, particle filter. So this is a particle filter twisted by psi. Um, and if you calculate this, you'll get an, an estimate of what the acceptance rate should be, the average acceptance rate should be under a omega twisted model instead of the psi twisted uh, model. Uh, so it gives you that average quantity um, and you can estimate it without having to run the targeted omega twisted Feynman CAC model or particle filter. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and target an acceptance rate within the iterative learning algorithm and we'll do that by changing our learned functions that we learned through the iterative algorithm by applying a temperature to the, to the uh, twisting functions that we learn. Um, so a really low temperature will really flatten out the, will really flatten out the uh, twisting functions and that'll raise our acceptance rate. But if we, if we were to say leave uh, just the temperature at one, it'll just be exactly the um, twisting function that the learning algorithm has told us we should use. Um, so just a sketch of that proof uh, for the previous proposition, you can think of the new omega uh, twisting functions being decomposed into the previous twisting function uh, multiplied by a residual. And then there's two nice properties where if you twist an already twisted um, marginal, that's just the same as uh, multiplying the two twisting functions together and twisting the base distribution. And if you um, rewrite a twisted um, model, the marginal of a twisted model can be rewritten as the base model multiplied by this integral um, with respect to the twisting function. Uh, and if you use those two things together, you end up being able to change your um, psi twisted, sorry, your omega twisted model to this, uh, to be in terms of a psi twisted model plus an integral, which does not involve omega, though you still can't evaluate this integral here because of the twisting that's been applied, because we assume that you can't apply that twisting analytically. So we want to, ex um, substitute um, everywhere we see this twisted 
um, this integral of this with respect to the twisted Markov um, kernel with just this ratio, which which holds. Um, and from that, you can pretty much derive the, the proposition. Um, the other thing we want to check before we go on is whether using um, the estimated um, twisted potential, so the Markov, um, sorry, the Monte Carlo estimate of the twisted potentials um, will lead to like an explosion in the variance or some kind of um, compounding in the variance of the estimates that we get. And it works out that if you can say there's an, a uniform bound on the relative variance between the estimated um, potentials, so these are these G tilde's relative to the original potentials, if, if that variance is bounded, then um, your asymptotic variance for the particle filter will also be bounded relative to the uh, original um, asymptotic variance. And so the, a rough sketch of that proof is you define a new equivalent feynman cac model on an augmented space where these U's are telling you um, uh, they're, they're the random variables that are to, involved with calculating that Monte Carlo expectation. Um, and the variance of a particle filter can be, the asymptotic variance of the particle filter can be decomposed into these V tilde PN terms, and you bound each of those VPN terms using the fact that the relative variance is bounded. And the main point of that was um, because you're bounding each of these VPN terms and they're related to each time point of your Feynman CAC model, um, you can show that the variance, your, your terminal variance asymptotically is not. Um, uh, it's not multiplicatively increasing. It's uh, each term is um, is bounded and, and, and it just isolated to each of those terms. So that's a nice a nice um, result uh, to keep in mind that you're not going to have some explosion so long as your relative um, variance is bounded. Um, so now an example on a linear Gaussian hidden Markov model. This is dimension three, um, 200 um, time points in, in the series. We have uh, informative, uh, uh, like an informative version where the variance of the potential functions that are involved normal distributions is 0 0.25 and one where it's one. And we have these A which define how the, um, state space evolves deterministically um, having this kind of relation where um, there's a um, order correlation of 0 0.42. Uh, and for the algorithm, we chose to use just the exponential quadratic twisting function um, because that means we can calculate the normalizing constant um, exactly and compare it to an exact version of this. Uh, we did three iterations of the iterative learning where we, where we targeted a smaller and smaller acceptance rate. Um, so it would be, yeah, the maximum of the acceptance rate we see or this targeted 0 0.04 and 0 0.02, et cetera. We used 200 particles for the twisted models and dynamical, dynamic multinomial sampling. Um, and we used N tilde, so that's the number of Monte Carlo samples we used um, for the unbiased estimate of the potential functions at 25, 50, and 100. Uh, we tested that over 100 repetitions. And our comparison is to a bootstrap particle filter, which uses um, the same memory, so in terms of um, storing the particles, and also a bootstrap particle filter, which used the same uh, computation, which we naively defined as uh, the number of uh, mutation draws. So how many times that Markov kernel is um, is actually used to, real, to, to generate a, a realization. Uh, and this was the results in terms of the error in the log uh, normalizing constant for these models. Um, so the left um, panel is to do with this informative um, scenario. 
for the potential functions and the right panel is for like a less informative version. The first psi auxiliary particle filter opt alpha is when you calculate the exact twisting functions, but then apply the method for tempering to target the acceptance rate that we wanted. And then the next three are where you learn what the twisting function should be. But as you go along, you change what the um, you change what the learn function is with this tempering by just by by targeting the particular acceptance rate. And then the final two are other comparisons. So the one with equivalent storage um, requirements and the one with equivalent computational requirements. And each of these facets um, are, are from a different realization. Um, so there is some like randomness uh, involved in comparing across. But the, the main takeaway is um, that uh, the learned twisted particle filters or twisted auxiliary particle filters um, do just as well or close to just as well as the optimal that um where you've had to change where you, we've had to change what the optimal is um to target an acceptance rate otherwise you get a particle filter that's got too high a computational cost um and the the third iteration um and i think all the iterations actually do much better than the comparative bootstrap particle filter in terms of storage but they don't do as well as the um, bootstrap particle filter in terms of computation cost. Um, and so this kind of makes us think that this method is probably going to be best suited to when um, the memory cost of a particular particle filter begins to start affecting the computational cost as well, which we haven't taken into, into account here because um, it's kind of a naive version of the computation cost where we're just looking at these um, mutation steps rather than actually calculating the entire runtime, which does get affected by how uh, large uh, these things are. And of course, the uh, computation version of this used way, way, way more particles than the um, 200 that were used. I think in some cases it was uh, close to 5,000 or more uh, particles versus the, I think it was 200, I said. Um, yeah, the 200 particles for the twisted version. So that's kind of the summary of the results for that toy model where we wanted to check things. Um, and we also realized like you really do have to watch the acceptance rates because um, the, the twisting functions are most, it's most important to use a twisting function when um, there is some like informativeness in the potentials. Um, so you wanna guide essentially your Markov kernel towards the right areas of the latent space. But when it is informative, that's when the rejection rate jumps up. So you have to like find a, a kind of like a sweet spot in terms of, um, yeah, guiding your Markov um, uh, process or Markov chain in, in the right direction, but also not doing it such that you have a blowout in computational cost because um, doing the rejection sampling is like, the dumb, but also um, necessary in, in this case, if you're assuming you don't have any way to do anything smarter um, way of, of, of tackling this problem. Uh, so um, that leads to like the next type of uh, scenario. So with tempering the con controlling the acceptance rate alters the twisting functions of those learned, but if, if your Markov kernel isn't intractable or it's, it somehow has some tractability that you can work with, it's possible that you could decompose your twisting functions into two parts. One where this var rho um, can twist your Markov kernel analytically, and then the remainder omega is just left for the re rejection sampler. Um, and if you do twist your, um, Markov kernel with the var rho, and then you use rejection sampling for the um, with Amiga, you do recover exact samples from the um, targeted psi twisting function. Um, 
So the idea in this scenario, if, if you can do it with the Markov kernel that you have, is to choose the var row such that you maximize acceptance rates. Um, so one particular example of this is a stochastic vo volatility model um, where you have some returns R and variance X um, that are governed by this set of equations um, where you have the returns being um, the variance of the returns being determined by this latent process X, um, Z being normal with some um, mean zero normal with some vari some, some, some of its own variance. And then um, your latent states X uh, determined by this SDE here. Um, but for this particular SDE, unit increments of X follow a scaled non-central chi-square distribution. Um, and if you sit down and you write out um, a particular representation of this distribution, you can work out that uh, it's possible to exponentially tilt that distribution um, analytically, which I did as part of my thesis. So for this example, we have a time series of, of, of size 2000. We chose the data to be generated um, with these parameters and in our Fame and CAC model, we changed them just a little bit, not too much, uh, and left the, the, the tempering variance to be the same. Um, and here you'll note we, we haven't chosen one, and that's because we wanted to give some more informativeness to the potential functions, because that's when the twisting functions can actually be useful. And we used an exponential quadratic twisting function for the rejection part, and an exponential linear or like a, just an exponential tilt part for the analytical part. We used two iterations of the iterative learning with uh, 100 particles. The final twisted particle filter we used n equals 250. Um, same resampling and then the same kind of comparison. Uh, and this was the result that we got was that after two um, versions, two iterations of the learning, the, because we were able to control the acceptance rate a lot better in this example, where there was some like a little bit more tractability in the, in the um, Markov kernel, we were able to really improve the estimates of the normalizing constant, except for one outlier um, that we were getting in comparison to the storage version, the, the storage comparative bootstrap particle filter, and also the computational um, comparative bootstrap particle filter. Um, so just to conclude, uh, I really did want to emphasize twisting models define, or can, the, the optimal twisted models can define perfect samplers. And I don't think this was highlighted to me enough when I first started on this, but there's no analogous result for MCMC. So I'm really interested in this space because you have like a perfect sampler that you can work towards defining. And of course, there are lots of difficulties, as you can see from this work, um, getting to that point. But um, there exists a perfect sampler which we can work, work towards or at least keep in mind when we're design, designing particle filters, regardless of whether you're using twisting or not, you can, you can keep that in mind. Um, the analytical twisting is limited to only a few models, which is kind of the motivation of this work. And if you think of like Bayesian conjugacy, it's the same kind of idea. You need the Markov kernel and the twisting function to be compatible with each other. Uh, we extended um, this with rejection sampling, though it had a high, and even though um, it had a high cost, our comparisons were kind of a bit harsh where we use this naive computational um, cost as a comparison, but it definitely reduced the memory. So high dimensional state spaces with um, long time series, this is potentially a really important or could be a part of a solution to um, reduce uh, computation uh, time. Uh, I personally want to explore these partial rejection options um, a bit more, uh, but but I, I need some other uh, examples, like motivating examples to work on. Um, yeah, and so these new models and, and are probably needed to really explore the full potential of this method. 
and a little bit more work on the asymptotic variance, I think, to determine if there's a way to filter out some models um, that you know won't benefit from this based on what um, their asymptotic variance is likely to be like. Um, thinking of like, if you could say something about how informative the potential functions need to be before you would try and use twisted um, famic models for your particle filter or not, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, just like, thanks for listening. Um, at 5 p.m. before a long weekend, I really appreciate you all coming and hopefully we'll see each other in person soon. Thanks, Josh. I'm clapping and I'm guessing everyone else is also clapping. Um, so we have a few minutes for, for some uh, questions and comments. So if anyone has any, uh, you can put them either in the chat or you can just unmute yourself. Um, maybe I can start with one. Um, oh, Robert, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Josh. So from this, can you uh, at all measure the variance of the likelihood when you conduct this particle filter to give you some sort of guidance if you want to do when you're doing MCMC or something like that? The, the variance of the marginal likelihood? No, the variance of the likelihood, of the likelihood estimate. Um, so you can use the same, like the methods that exist using ancestors or the more recent methods which don't to, to get um, estimates of variance, unbiased variance estimates from um, one run of a particle filter apply here. So you could use those. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, is that easy to, is that easy to use to get reliable estimates? Um, in my experience, the ancestor methods for those types of um, one step variance estimates aren't always that reliable. Um, but I haven't tried the, the new work that's come out about it. So I, I do need to go look at that. Um, do, um, do you mean in terms of deciding whether to use twisting or not? Well, uh, more than that, uh, in order to suppose that you're doing MCMC and um, you want to do a PMH or something like that. And mm. then you, so then you need to understand the variance of the of the log likelihood or more uh, exactly the variance of the differences in the log likelihood estimates on uh, the difference in the in the the variance of the difference so you want to sort of get some sort of idea of the if you knew the variance of the log of the likelihood estimate you could understand also something about the variance of the um, difference between the numerator and denominator in doing PMMH. I think if you use a good twisting function, your variance almost certainly decreases. Um, and like I said, if you can use the optimal one, you have no variance for your estimate of the normalizing constant. Um, but I don't, th this work doesn't give, I, I'm interested to think about how uh, twisting functions could help you get such an estimate, but this, this work doesn't address that. Okay. But actually, I understand your point, yeah. Yeah, actually going back to what you suggested, can you with this, you might have covered this, can you get from this an estimate of the variance of the marginal likelihood? 
or do yeah. you have to just replicate? Uh, I mean, when you when you use the twisted when you use the twisted model, you're applying the same particle filter that you would apply to the non-twisted model. It's just that the sequence of Markov kernels and potential functions have changed. So any method that you can apply to like a bootstrap particle filter to get an estimate of the uh, or to get an estimate of the variance that you're after, you can apply it to it to the particle filter to the twisted model. Sure, but I don't have as present for me to when I get an estimate of the log of the marginal likelihood, mm. I have to replicate in order to get an estimate of the variance. I can't just get it uh, otherwise. Can sure. you yeah. can you with your new insights uh, do better than that? Uh, not yet. I know that there are papers that address that. Um, it's not. It's it's an interesting question. I'm, I I think like because the twisting functions are doing something to change your um, path space, it would be or, or path measure. It would be interesting to see if that gives you a way to get the kind of estimate you're after. But I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but certainly the the work on unbiased variance estimates from particle filters using ancestors and then there's been i think one or two papers that are not using the ancestry of the particles um ad address getting like any for lack of a better word an instantaneous estimate of the the variance of whatever um expectation from your particle filter you're after okay yeah thanks it's okay thanks for coming Thanks, Robert. Um, is there anyone else who want to ask a question? So, um, Josh, I was um, thinking about your first example uh, where you have these normals. Is that the, a case where you would know what is the exact twisting? Um, you can write it down, yes, but, um, yeah, you can write it down, you don't want to, you can also create like a recursion on the computer to calculate it for you, which is what I did, um, but it's, it's nasty, it's, it's, yeah, it's nasty either way, like after, if it was only two or three time steps, it's okay. But after that, it gets a bit, a bit hairy um, because you have to define it recursively still. Yeah. So, so did you use them? Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. the first, um, that first line. Okay. Um, if you don't do the tempering where you change it a little bit, you get a point estimate at the exact normalizing constant that, you, that you're after. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was the reason for doing this example and uh, where you could do it all analytically was to at least have a baseline, like a proper baseline, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking about. I've, maybe I had missed it in the first place. Yeah, but for, for me, it was really interesting that if you take the optimal twisting functions and you do the tempering on each of them, you're not necessarily going to get a better twisting function than doing it sequentially whilst you're learning them. And it's, yeah, it has to do with the fact that you're actually only trying to get like the terminal um, distribution to be the one that you want perfect samples for. So you actually take that terminal um, twisting function, temper it a little bit, and then that will affect how you temper all the way down the line in the recursion. That was yeah. something that I had to stop and think about for a long time. Yeah, I, I would need to think about it a bit yeah. more to fully grasp it. Okay, um, I see that uh, slowly but surely everyone's um, going on their long weekend. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's probably time for for us to um, 
to thank you again for for the great talk and um yeah if anyone has any questions i guess i will just direct him direct them to you please do thanks so much for having me all right guys have a good long weekend thanks michael thanks no worries thanks Josh. all right uh we'll see you soon yeah bye sure will <laughs>